Amen. You guys can have a seat just for, I would say, a few minutes. We'll see how this message kind of gets put together. Um, I got a lot of thoughts. I got a lot of things that I want to say as we open up the new year. Um, and I think we're just going to have a little bit of fun just for a few minutes. Um, we are kicking off today a brand new series that we're calling Destination Addiction. Now, this series was birthed from the last series that we preached, Due Season. And if you were here for that series, what we talked about how is how Due Season is when preparation and opportunity collide. And as I closed out that series last month, Due, due Season, I, I really talked about how we're not waiting on a due season, that we can experience a due season right now in our life that we've already been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And so the due season for us, if we're not waiting on anything, would be for us to discover unending enjoyment. That's the due season, D-U-E. And as we begin to dive into this idea of destination addiction, it is actually what keeps us from discovering that unending enjoyment. So over the next five weeks, we are going to talk about it. So what is it? Destination addiction is the idea that happiness or success is always found in the next season. It's when, then. When I make this amount of money, then I'll be happy. When I get to retire, then I can relax. When I get married, then I'll think my life is full. When, then. Matter of fact, this phrase, destination addiction, it was coined by Dr. Robert Holden. He says this, until you give up the idea that happiness is somewhere else, you'll never be happy where you are. I'm getting there is the phrase we tend to use. Success is at the end of the rainbow. Enlightenment is in the next meditation. And heaven is in the hereafter. And as a result, we are psychologically or mindfully absent because we're not fully here. We're always preoccupied with getting through the day rather than actually being in the day. We're constantly striving but never arriving. You see, it's really crucial that we talk about this because if you're always just thinking about the when, if you're always just future-minded, if you're consumed with that, you'll never be able to enjoy where you're at. Last week, um, Corey, we, we put out an uh, online service, and in it, Corey opened up the year by talking about the five keys to a full life. It was a very brief message, but it was very powerful. And in it, it was really like a how-to, in a sense, of enjoying life now, not waiting till one day when. And these five keys were go slow, be curious, do less, love more, and stay satisfied. Those are the five keys. And so in this series, Destination Addiction, to fight against that, we're actually going to look at each one of these keys individually, and today we're going to start with this idea of going slow. Now, to help us out and to help me lay a foundation for you to where I want to take you on this journey today, I actually um, brought a couple uh, Christmas gifts that, um, that I stole from my kids. No, I'm just lying. I just bought them yesterday. But I... I did have this, like, experience with my kids as they began to open some of their presents. And I have four boys. Two of them are 11 and 10, and they love Legos. They're in the season where they love building. They love getting Lego sets. The problem is these things are, like, so expensive. My gosh, like this little box with this little character, I don't even want to tell you how much I paid for that yesterday just for this illustration. It's a lot. But they, but they got these Lego sets for Christmas, and I'm sitting down, and Titus gets his out. He goes right right after we open presents, opens his up, and he get, begins to sit down and just put these Lego sets together. Now, what you have to know about these Lego sets is that there's already a picture of what you're building 
on the box, and not only is there the picture of what you're building with all of the Legos you need to build this, there is an instruction manual. Look how thick this thing is. A step-by-step -step guide how to put this together. And it will tell you, step one, grab these four pieces, put them together in this order. Step two, here's the eight pieces. Put them together, connect them back to step one, and so so and so, so on and on and on, until you get to the finished product, which is this guy. And I'm sitting down and I'm watching Titus and he's putting this together and he's got his instruction menu out and he's, he's just going to town. And in about probably two hours, he has the entire thing already built and he's like, man, this is so cool, but he knows how much they cost, number one, but also he knows the time and effort put into it. So I'm like, what are you gonna do with that? You gonna play with it? You're gonna, no, I'm just gonna sit it on my shelf admire it, look at it, and it just sits there. And as I'm having this conversation with him and I'm watching him put all this together, I'm thinking in my life, like many of us, we actually want this for our journey with Jesus. We want the picture of what our life is going to turn out to be. And we want the instruction, instruction manual in how to get there. Here's step one. Here's step two. Here's what you do this year. Next year, you're going to do X, Y, Z. This year, you're going to do this and that. And we want this as we're following after Jesus. But the thing is, I really experienced this amazing journey with him. It's not like this at all. Matter of fact, it's more like what we got if, if you're older than like 35 or 40. This is what we got when we were kids, right? Just a tub of Legos. Your parents would give you this, build something. Well, what do I build? Whatever you can come up with. It doesn't matter. Just get busy. Be creative. Use your imagination. And we would try to put this stuff together. And we had no clue what we were doing, but we were excited about it. I couldn't wait for my little odd structure to be built and to be shared with my parents. Mom, Dad, look what I made. Look what I created. You know, not one time in the probably 20 to 30 things that my kids put together like that, did they ever say, Dad, look what I created. No, because they're just following some instruction manual. But whenever they get this out and they build something, it can be like a stick figurine of I don't even know what it is, and they're excited to tell me all about it. But this really is kind of like life in the kingdom. Ideas included, some ideas but no instruction manual exactly. There's no perfect plan for it. And how does this tie in to going slow? How does this tie in to life in the kingdom? Because how I see it, as we begin to look around and we begin to really look at other people's lives, whether it's our friends, whether it's our, our coworkers, whether it's other family members, whether it's people in our neighborhood, we look at their life and we see maybe this, something accomplished, something they're active in, something they're involved in, but we have no idea the process of what it took to get there. And so we feel like we're building with this, but we can't wait to catch up and build with that. And so we're running this rat race and keeping up with the Joneses, so to speak, and we just burn ourselves out trying to maybe be what somebody else is already doing. We try to live our life based on what other people may have accomplished or put together in their life, and that causes us to live a hurried life. Matter of fact, the, the scripture I want to share with you, speaking of God's plan and how really it's kind of broad, it's not specific, Paul writes to the church, in uh, Thessalonica, he says this, 1 Thessalonians chapter uh, 5, check this out, verse 16, he says, rejoice always, not just some of the time, not just when you get to a certain thing, then you can rejoice, not when you get that raise, not when you get that permission, or permission, well, I guess it can be permission, but not when you get that promotion, but you can rejoice always. Verse 17, pray continually. Verse 18, give thanks in all circumstances. Rejoice, pray, give thanks. For this is God's will for you 
in Christ Jesus. I love how the Passion Translation puts this, if we can pull that up real quick. He says this uh, in the Passion. It says, let joy be your continual feast. Let your life be a prayer. In every situation, give thanks, for this is God's perfect plan for your life. That's how the Passion puts that. So you want to know what the plan is? It's not a step-by-step step instruction manual. It is to rejoice always, to pray continually, to give thanks in all circumstances. But what really, what keeps us from doing that? What, what helps us slow down and actually enjoy life, where joy can be a continual feast, where we can really rejoice always? How can we go slow? How can we enter into our due season where we discover unending enjoyment? Well, I'm going to tell you today it's this. It's when we stop comparing. It's when we stop comparing our life to other people's lives. And so what I want to share with you real quick, I got three keys because I really, I really think that comparison man, is the biggest killer for us enjoying life in the kingdom today. So we have to talk about what robs this joy from us. And now many of you may be thinking, you know what? I, I'm going to do something because I don't like this stuff right here. Um, Don, I saw a couple boys sit next to you. Maybe they would like this. They can put that together. And uh, I saw my friend Jen walk in. I know you got a little son. You can do <laughs> Help him discover some amazing creations, you and Dean, together. So if we think about it, many of you might be saying, you know, what's the big deal about comparing? Some of you might believe that comparing actually leads to us doing better, maybe being better. But in reality, comparing is detrimental to our life. It's found all through the scripture. Matter of fact, Jesus, he's hanging out with Peter after his resurrection. He's restoring Peter back to a place of relationship with him, and he actually has to tell him that he's eventually going to really be martyred, and he's going to have to die for his faith in Jesus. And Peter's looking around, and he sees the other disciple, John, and he says, well, what, what about him? Jesus replies with, what's that to you? What if I want him to remain until I come again, but you follow me? You see, Peter was comparing, well, i got to live this way. Does everybody have to die for their faith? What about the other disciples? What about John? And if you think about Peter, um, it, there's so many places that Peter, he looks around and he thinks that he has to be someone else. He has to do something in order to gain approval. It's crazy when we look at the comparison model of, of Peter. Even Paul calls us, as the church, what? The body of Christ. We're one body, but different Parts. We're not all the same, but we function as a whole in unity. Even Jesus, he says in John 10, 10, he says, The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. Now, in the context, Jesus is talking not about the devil or anything like that. He's talking about the law. When you live by the old Mosaic system, that is the thief that steals from you, that kills you, that destroys you your life. Jesus wants you to enter into relationship. That is the abundant life. But for today's purposes, I'm going to say that comparison is that thief, that thief that steals, kills, and destroys. So if you're taking notes, I encourage you to write this down. This is how we're going to combat and go against destination addiction by stop comparing because we have to understand, number one, comparison steals our contentment. I believe that, honestly, discontentment has never been a big, bigger problem in the history of the world than it is today. Never have people had so much and yet still are unsatisfied. And sociologists actually will say that social media is actually one of the biggest driving causes of discontentment because what happens now is we get an access and a look into everyone else's life around us and we think their lives are perfect because there are these things called filters right and when we see this stuff we feel inferior and I know one pastor he says it this way we compare other people's highlight reels to our behind the scenes 
Like, we know what's real about our life. We know what's really going on, but we could look around and see everybody else's highlight reels and think they got it going on, and we feel infer- inferior. And this is fascinating. It was 2015. Uh, researchers did a study at two universities. They had college students come in, and they had them just spend 30 minutes, a half an hour on Facebook, and they then surveyed their feelings after. Thousands of students went through this research, and what they found is one-third, 33% of the students felt significantly more depressed, citing envy as the number one emotion of what they just experienced. After 30 minutes on Facebook, the number one emotion that was felt by most people, envy, wanting what someone else had. And so this is an issue that we have to talk about. This is an issue that we have to expose in our life, this area of discontentment. And maybe for you, it's some type of financial discontentment. You see people and they have the new vehicle and you hate your car and you want to be happy for them, but you're a little bit jealous. Or maybe someone else posts a picture of of their meal, but you're not really looking at their meal. You're looking beyond the meal to their kitchen and you're seeing their cabinets and what they look like and and the pictures on the wall and, and all of the stuff. And you're thinking, oh my gosh, they have a perfect house. You're not caring about the food. And you're like, I wish I had that. Or maybe you see people and they're sending you pictures or even posting pictures of their like third vacation at the beach this year. And you're like, I haven't been able to even go to my friend's pool this year. They haven't invited me over. And they're on their third vacation. I mean, we're, we're just talking about real stuff. I know emotions that we all feel. The next is maybe relational discontentment. Relational. You see your friends at a party and you're like, wait, some of those are my friends. Why wasn't I invited to that party? FOMO starts to creep in or maybe... Uh, maybe you're not married, but you look around and you think that everybody else in your, in your circle is married and they're happy and you're not. You see maybe relational intimacy that other people have and you're like, oh man, it looks like they have such a great marriage. I wish we had a great marriage. But can I tell you right now, most of the stuff I'm talking about people put out on Facebook, people that have to put out they have a great marriage on Facebook probably really don't behind the scenes. People posting that picture of, of their vehicles probably didn't pay cash for those vehicles, and they got into an amazing, enormous amount of debt on those vehicles. The third one could just be circumstantial discontentment. You're looking at your life, you're comparing it to someone else, and you think, like the Lego set, I wish I was where they're at. I thought maybe my life would be more significant. Now, the Apostle Paul, he had the greatest perspective of this idea of discontentment. In fact, if you're going to If you want to turn there with me, I'm going to go to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to look at what I think is the best verse in all of Scripture on contentment. And as we read this, what you have to understand is Paul right now is writing from a prison. He's in jail, chained to a guard 24 hours a day. Like, he's not writing this from, like, the beach. He's not writing this from a vacation spot or his, like, little writing den in his house. Like, he is in jail. And he writes this, Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 12. He says, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content, the secret of being content in any and every situation. In other words, if life's going the way I want to, or if life is falling apart and not going the way I want to, I know the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And here's the secret. He says this, verse 13, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. You see, he says it's not found contentment in what I have or what I don't have. Contentment is found in Christ. You see, you can search and search. You can get Likes on social media, you can be in great circles relationally, you can be successful financially, but until you experience the goodness of Jesus, I'm, I'm here to tell you, you will always be dissatisfied. You will always be longing for something more because until you let Christ be all you need, you'll always battle with the enemy of discontentment. Another reason we need to stop comparing if you're taking notes, number two, Comparison kills our humility. It steals, and now it kills our humility. Jesus, he's telling a story uh, about prayer, and really more than that, it's about pride. 
And he's talking about a Pharisee, which was just a religious leader of the day, a teacher of the law in that day. And this Pharisee was praying. Let's check out verses 9 through 14. This, this, I wanted to share this whole story because I think it's very, very cool. Verse 9, it says this, Jesus' words, To some who were confident in their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Verse 12, I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all that I have. Verse 13, but the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Verse 14, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. But can you see the audacity that this Pharisee had? That's about as arrogant as you can get. But I'm telling you right now, we do this still all the time. And we do it in our thoughts. Now, if you're thinking, I don't know if I really do that, or I don't know if I've really seen that. Well, it was just Christmas time. And we see this, and I've seen this a lot over the last month in the toy toy aisle at the store, whether it was Walmart, Target, wherever. Because I would be walking through there Christmas shopping, and without a doubt, every single time I went to the store, here is a kid screaming, crying, (laughs) crazy-eyed, throwing a fit, rolling on the floor, because they wanted something. Maybe their parents brought them to buy a toy for someone else for Christmas. They thought they were getting something. And in that moment, I could see parents looking around. Matter of fact, I'm not going to lie. I was like, man, please, can you get control of your kid? Oh, my kids would never do that. No, I'm just messing. Those are the people that say that, oh, my kids would never do that, are honestly people that don't have kids of their own parents we know (laughs) we know how it is we've been through through it all whether it was there or somewhere else it just is life but but we get these we get these ideas where we become a little bit prideful or we think well I would never do that whatever it is I just came up with a little bitty funny story but whatever it is in life I know I can be in a situation and I'm just throwing myself under the bus where I see people do something that I know is detrimental to their health And I'm like, I can't believe they'd be doing that. And if I could just get with them and spend like 20 minutes to give them some knowledge and information, if I could just come alongside and kind of mentor them and coach them, I can't believe they would be doing that. And then I leave and I go through the drive-thru at McDonald's and get my kids Big Macs. Like, seriously, like who, why am I like that? Why do I do that? It's because I have a little bit of pride in my life that needs to be maybe killed. And so I, I, just for me, I, again, I'm continuing to throw myself under the bus. I'm giving you all examples from my life, so you can enjoy that. Because this it's a, isn't always easy to share things like this, but I remember it wasn't actually too long ago. And those of you that listen to our podcast, Two Pastors and a Mic, I shared this story recently. So if you do listen to that, um, this will be a repeat story for you. But if you aren't on um, Spotify or Apple or listen to the podcast, what are you waiting for, number one? But number two, this will be new for you. But I remember a couple years ago, I was driving. I was on my way to Madison, Indiana, and you got to go through a lot of back roads to get there. And uh, I was by myself, and I just remember I I passed a few churches. It was a Saturday. And then I I noticed a pattern at some of these smaller rural country churches. And the pattern was that there would be a vehicle, like, in the parking lot. And I was thinking, oh, well, that's probably the pastor. Like he probably had to work all week and now it's Saturday and he's in there. He's getting a message uh, for Sunday. Just wanted to bless the people of that church. And so I just felt compelled to just start praying. So every single church and honestly, the back roads here in Indiana, man, you can't go 10 miles and not pass like 20 churches. Like, so I probably passed 50 just from here to Madison. And I'm going through, and I'm just starting to pray for these, each of these churches. God, will you bless that church? Man, just pour out your, your love. And, and I just pray that they awaken to who you are, their identity, that this little town just blows up with excitement, and people come from all over, and that pastor is blessed, and he begins to get financially blessed. And I'm just like praying. And then I just hear God just really minister me in this moment. And he says, what if I answered your prayer exactly how you're praying, and they end up 
more blessed than what you think you're, you are right now in this moment. Would that be okay? And I had to check, like, well, I mean, I know I'm very blessed right now, but I don't know if I would want another pastor more blessed than me or another church more blessed than Hill City. I'm just going to be honest. I don't know. And in that moment, it was another check, like, well, you need to look at your humility right now. Are you doing this and praying from a superior place because that's not good, or is it a true heartfelt prayer? And in that moment, my prayer life began to just shift in that moment as I pray for other churches and other pastors, and I hope every single one of them, I don't care if they're whatever success looks like. I'm going to tell you what success looks like in a minute, but I don't care if they are way more successful than us because we're all on the same team. We're all part of the kingdom, and that would be amazing for this area and region if that were to happen. Lastly, we want to stop comparing, and all these things are tying into us slowing down our lives because comparison destroys our gratitude. I told you the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and comparison does all three. It destroys our gratitude. It makes us resentful. I think we see this all through Scripture, but for me, one of my favorite stories to preach this from is 1 Samuel chapter 18. It's the story right after David killed Goliath. We all hopefully know the story. If not, it's one of the like Sunday school messages. It's the message of the giant fell, an amazing act of faith on David's part to trust in God. He went out with right a sling and a stone. He killed Goliath, and it was this great victory for the nation of Israel. And it's literally right after this that these words are recorded. 1 Samuel 18, starting in verse 6. It says, When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the woman came out, <clears throat> or sorry, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs and with timbrels and lyres. As they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. So what's happening in this moment, a modern day translation would be that they just won the championship. Queens, we are the champion, is playing in the background. Confetti's coming down from the ceiling. Fireworks are going off. The cheerleaders are coming out, and they're cheering. They're, they're hooting and hollering, and this is exactly what is happening in this moment. And then check out what Saul does. It says this, if we keep reading. Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands? What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. You see, as we begin to compare, it makes us resentful. And it's important for us to understand this because when we compare, we resent God's goodness in others' lives and ignore God's blessing in our own life. Let me say that again. When we compare... We resent God's goodness in others' lives and ignore God's blessing in our own life. And this is exactly what happened to Saul. As he began to look on, it didn't matter that David had just killed Goliath for him. It didn't matter that he just won a great victory for Saul. It didn't matter that for years, over a decade, David faithfully served Saul. He was loyal to him, faithful to him. All that stuff didn't matter. All he heard was, wait, they think David is better than me? That he could kill tens of thousands, but me only thousands? You see, he couldn't be happy for him. Why? Because he became resentful of God's goodness in David's life, and he ignored the blessing in his own. What was the blessing in his own life? The dude was the king. Could do whatever he wanted. Could make any decision that he wanted. He could go anywhere, but he ignored that, and we do that so many times. We let the cancer of comparison come into our life, and we begin to resent God's goodness in someone else's life, and we are blinded to the blessing in our own. You see, this is what comparison does, and if this is the year where we really want to experience the full life that God has for us, we have to begin to slow down to enjoy it, and to slow down, we have to stop comparing because comparison steals, kills, and destroys. I'm going to get Tim and the keys to come up and help me just as I close. 
This is so vital, and, and it might be maybe a practical message. It's not like anything deep theologically or anything like that that I had for you. But as we begin the year, 2023, if we could really just begin to focus on what God is doing in our life and not comparing ourselves with others, I promise you that is when you will begin to experience the full abundant life that Jesus has for you. Because really success in the kingdom, it's not about being inferior or superior to someone else. It's not some balancing scale. Check this out. Success in life is about being who God wants you to be, not who you wish you were. See, I pray that today you would understand that, man, God calls you to something so amazing. And when you begin to understand who you are, because in knowing who you are, you know who you don't have to be. When you know your identity in Christ and you know that fully, you know who you don't have to be. You don't have to be the amazing Star Wars little robot thing walking around with Chewbacca inside. You can build whatever you want with God. That is the amazingness of this journey that we get to do it with God. So quit trying to be somebody you wish you were and be who God wants you to be. And if you can do that, when you get to that place, you can go slow. And when you go slow, you can truly discover an ending enjoyment. And when you find that enjoyment in where you are because of who you are, you get to avoid the trap of destination addiction. And that's my prayer. More than anything else this year, let's get out of the when and begin to experience the then right now. You don't have to wait to experience God's goodness in your life. Let me pray for you. Father, I just pray right now that as we hear a message like this, it can seem rather practical and it can seem like, well, yeah, we know we're not supposed to compare. I would just, I would just pray that you would begin to expose through your spirit ways that really comparison does rob from our life because we're always trying to maybe be someone else or to do something what someone else is doing instead of just actively being excited about what you have for us to walk in confidently in who you've created us to be. Not who we wish we were, but truly, you called us a masterpiece created in you to do good works. And I pray that as we understand that we are that masterpiece, we can stop comparing our lives to others and we can truly avoid this trap that success and happiness and enjoyment and life to the full is found somewhere else and in something else but it can be found only in you and as we awaken to that as this church awakens to that that is when we're going to make the biggest impact have the most influence into our relationships and in this city and i pray that we would explode in our influence because of knowing who we are. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, church, I hope you were encouraged. Next week, come back. Pastor Corey is going to dive into this idea of destination addiction, talking about how we are to be curious, and that combats destination addiction. And I know Pastor Corey, he's been working on this message for a couple weeks, and you're going to be so blessed next week. But this week, Stop comparing. Let's, let's just remove that and actually enjoy who we are and what God has for us today. Can we do that? Amen. Well, bless you. We love you. And just know as you leave, you are loved and there's nothing you can do about it. We'll see you guys next Sunday.